Hi, I'm Brent Johnson, and today we're in the studio again. Uh, I have a film to show you. This is a 1945 production of the Canadian Film Board called The Singing Pipes. It's essentially an instructional and educational video on how pipe organs work and, and how they're made and a little bit of the history. All of the organ building scenes in this were shot in the Cassavant Frere Organ Factory in St. Hyacinth, Quebec. So we're seeing Cassavant in the 1940s. Once again, if you see anybody you think you might recognize or you know their names, uh, it would be great to to try to get all these people identified. Just leave a comment down in the description uh, with the time and who you think it might be. Um, there's even a chief technician that's recognized, and I don't, I don't know who that would be, so it would be great to identify all of the people in this video. Uh, we hear Bernard Pichet playing the Cassavant organ at the Quebec Basilica. It's called then. Now it's the Basilica Cathedral Notre Dame in Quebec City. Um, that's home to Cassavant's Opus 1217, built in 1927. Then it had four manuals and 69 ranks. It's been modified a couple of times since then, but uh, we're getting to hear it in its original state. And as I say that, the audio on this is not great. It was a film strip from 1945. Um, I've cleaned up the audio as much as I can so you can understand the narrator and it gets rid of some of the noise, but there's still a lot to be desired, especially with the music. But it's an interesting look back uh, to see how much uh, has changed, how much hasn't changed in organ building from 1945. We have this video thanks to Dean Huff of Lyons, Colorado. Thank you, Dean, for sending this in. Uh, if any of you have... Uh, similar materials that you think our viewers would enjoy uh, we can help you get it on our channels just uh, send me an email our contact information is all at organ.media now from 1945 the singing pipes Mankind, from its earliest beginning, has been intrigued by the possibilities of molding natural phenomena into harmonious sound. This simple boy's whistle suggests the primitive beginning of our modern organ. It makes use of the principle of creating sound by blowing air into a pipe. The shepherds of ancient times joined a few such small whistles together. This was the pan flute. Later, as music pipes became larger and more unwieldy, other ways were found to blow air into them. By hand bellows, as in the Middle Ages. and by foot bellows. This means of producing sound continued without much change until the advent of electricity. And even today, it's not uncommon to find it still being used. Essentially, the technique of organ building today is the same as in olden times. As in the 16th century, the hot metal is poured into the iron pot. Then impurities are skimmed off with a ladle. There is only one moment when the metal, neither too hot nor too cold, 
is the correct temperature for pouring. It is poured into a casting box, from which it is spread on a linen-covered casting bench. As it cools off, the metal changes in texture. The contraction of the lead and the tin in this particular alloy causes spots to appear. The sheet is now cut with a hook into different shapes for the different sizes of pipes. Then it is polished with a steel scraper. The feet and the bodies of the pipes are given their form by rolling and beating on a mandrel. burnished flat. It is then time to solder the small bodies. First, the seam is tacked. Then the seam is run. The languid, which shapes the tone of the pipe, is fastened to the inside at the point where the foot and the body meet. The foot is closed, also by soldering. Next, the mouth is open. What are known as shallots are hammered out for the reed pipes. and a slot is left on which the tongue of the reed rests. Now the blocks which support the reeds are molded. And the pipes are mounted on them. These are of inverted cone shape and in the organ they comprise the trumpets, the oboes, the clarinets, the English horns, etc. The rolling of the larger pipes makes use of the same technique as the smaller ones, but on a bigger scale. as before. And then the seam is run. The feet of the big pipes are also rolled and beaten. and the foot is soldered to the body. The ears are placed in position. The ears serve to stabilize the toes. The lips are polished and the pipe is finished. This is the woodworking shop. Wood also plays an important role in organ building. Cotton wood for the wind chests because of its tight grain, British Columbia pine for the expression boxes, maple, birch for the frame, oak, walnut and mahogany for the cases and console. Also from British Columbia pine, certain wooden pipes are made, the flutes and the borden.
The pedal keys are shaped from Quebec birch. In another corner of this shop, the boring and construction of wind chests takes place. The wind chests are the support, the base of all the pipes. They receive the wind from the reservoir and the blower. Here, the canal for a mixture stop is bored. The rack board, which holds the pipes, is fixed to the wind chest. The rack board is bored to receive the pipes into the regular wind chest. Also in this wind chest are placed the valve boards which allow the wind to enter each pipe. The action of the valves is controlled by electromagnets. And in the distributing wind chest, electromagnets are also placed. They control the valves which serve to open the stops, couplers and registration. In the making of electromagnets, copper wires, each measuring approximately 2,000 feet, are wound around cores. In the making of the keyboard, one single piece of wood is used, which has beforehand been cut with extreme precision. The ivories are glued onto one side of the keyboard. And so the delicate work goes on. Throughout this industry, there remains, even today, a great tradition carried on in families from father to son. The genuine love of these artisans for their craft embraces the entire building of the great pipe organ and is not confined to their individual tasks. In this industry, the artisan has not lost his identity as a human being and his personal integrity is valued as much as his manual skill. In an age when a machine has done so much to make a machine out of man, the survival of a craft spirit and a craft skill in a community is of no small importance. At last, the long ivories are placed to be glued. The keys are bushed to prevent rattling. The numbered notes are all placed in their proper order and the keyboard is completed. This one is the solo, the others, the swell and the great organ. In another shop are being assembled the keyboard, the valves, the electromagnets, the registration mechanism, the crescendo, the couplers, the pneumatics to operate the couplers, the console, the pedal contacts, the keyboard contacts. The contacts of the keyboard and the pedals through the medium of the west transmit the current to the electromagnet. There are hundreds of contacts made of sterling silver. The junction board is the meeting place of the wires which come from the keyboard and go to the electromagnets of the organ. Each wire is a circuit and on this console there are about 1800 of them. The names of the tablets and the stops are engraved on ivories and filled with colored wax. In the voicing rooms for the reed pipes, the voicer takes the tongue and gives it a curve with a burnisher. adjusts the tongue on the shallot with the tuning wire and gives more or less length to the vibrating part of the tongue as required.
trumpet pipe is voiced on the voicing machine, as it is called. An eight-foot trumpet is voiced. Vibrations of the tongue of a 32-foot reed pipe. The tongue, when actuated by the wind, beats against the shallot. The length and the beating of the tongue also govern the pitch. A 16-foot trumpet is voiced. In the flue pipes, such as the diapason, the pitch is determined by the length of the body. The mouth is trimmed again, this time to make it speak. The wind enters by the foot, passes through the flue, a thin opening between the lower lip and the languid, and sets in motion the air column inside the body. The teeth are nicked so that the pipes will speak clearly. A pipe which has no teeth whistles exactly like a toothless man. The pipe is then voiced on the voicing machine. The huge diapasons are also voiced. While in another voicing room, a dolce flute is being adjusted and voiced. organ building, technicians and draftsmen play a very important role. Each organ has its own blueprint, its combination of particular stops, and new construction problems come up every day. When finally the many parts are finished, they are taken to the assembly room, where the finished frame and cases are mounted, the pipes are installed, and the final touches are given to the mechanism. The pedals which operate the deepest stops are put into position. While the voicer tests, the tuner adjusts the tone and volume of the pipes. The expression pedal opens and closes the louvers or blades of the expression box to increase or diminish volume. The modern electric blower sends compressed air through the windpipes to the reservoirs and to the tremulant box, which delivers the wind in shocks into the pipe. Finally, the chief technician comes personally to inspect the completed organ after which it will be taken apart and shipped to church or concert hall. And so a modern pipe organ of the ancient family of singing pipes is ready to be born into the world of music, that world without frontiers in which all men may freely commute.